Welcome to Chinook Funds Grant Application Workshop. I'm so glad to see uh, such a wide variety of folks who have RSVP'd. Um, it's really exciting for me to get to share all of our criteria and knowledge um, with you all who are interested in applying um, or just learning more about our process. Um, just a little bit about um, how I'm running this today. Um, I have two screens, so I might like it might look like I'm sort of looking off into the distance, but um, I am in fact actually just looking at my my notes and the slides. Um, so uh, we'll run through a lot of information from me. It is going to be you know a good amount of me talking. Um, please feel free to type right into the chat any questions that come up. Um, if I can answer them right in the moment, I will. Um, or you know I'll wait until the end for a quick Q and A session where you all can ask questions and I'll answer them right in that moment. Um, so uh, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Jessica, she, her pronouns. Um, I've been on staff for, it's hard to believe, but seven years now. Um, I started as an administrative manager at Chinook and then um, sort of taking on more roles as you know, I'm sure a lot of you do at your various nonprofit organizations. Um, so I manage system software, sort of keeping the lights on, the bills paid. Um, and then I'm also, you know, the first point of contact for um, all of our grant making with applicants and organizations that are interested in applying. Um, and I manage sort of all of the contact um, and logistics around our grant making process. Um, so I'm the person that you're gonna wanna go to if you have questions. Um, or if things are feeling a little bit unclear about our process. Uh, we are a staff of five, so we're a small ship. Um, as for me running this, uh, this workshop on my own. Um, so a lot of us wear a lot of different hats in the work that we do here. So here is just an overview of um, what I'm gonna cover today. Um, our goals are really just for me to share information about Chinook with all of you um, and to make our grant making guidelines and priorities clear as well as give you a sense of what um, actually applying on our grant making portal looks like, how to do that, um, and what our grant making process looks like um, in terms of timeline um, and details. So we'll have um, just some introductions where you all will type into the chat box. Um, and then I will go over a history of Chinook Fund. We've been around for 32 uh, years now, so going strong with our um, social justice grant making. Um, give you a sense of what our grant making framework is, how we think about grant making, um, then specifically our giving project, which is how we make grants right now and what the process looks like. Um, go into detail about our grant making criteria. I'm sure that's what is the, of most interest to you all. Um, and then uh, give you some details on what we do and we do not fund. Um, talk a lot about community organizing because that really is what we prioritize in our grant making. So making that definition very clear. Um, give you a little bit of information about our grantees, past and present. Um, we have some um, information there about uh, sort of like history of grant making. And then um, I'll go into depth around our grant application logistics, how to access our portal, um, all the information that is needed there. Um, and then we'll have some time for Q&A &A and then uh, just some basic logistical deadline information. Um, so please feel free to type into the chat any questions that come up um, as, as they happen for you. Uh, so if you all don't mind, I'd love to just get a sense of who is here um, and then you all can see who is here as well. Just to type into the chat um, your name and your organization, uh, nice and simple, um, get a sense of who is here today. So, and I have some notes here that I'm going to read off of. Um, so this is a quote from a grantee. We've done um, several grantee evaluations over our time as a foundation, and this came up, I think, in a 2012 um, evaluation. Uh, this quote is, being a Chinook grantee has helped provide us with a framework for social change. Um, we really pride ourselves on being super clear around what our criteria are, what our processes are, um, what our timeline is, as well as giving um, very clear and frank feedback to uh, groups that have applied. And that could be reasons for not being funded or feedback from our um, grant making decision makers uh, in conjunction with uh, a funding recommendation. Um, so, uh, you know, there are definitely organizations who use our frameworks to sort of broaden their social justice definitions, really move more fully into um, being organizations that 
uh, really go above and beyond in terms of our criteria because they see it as a larger framework for how to think about um, social change work and community organizing. So our history, uh, we've been around since 1987. You can see this great picture on the left. Um, we recently went through scanning all of our old files and I found some gems of uh, pictures and documents from back in the day when we were getting all paper grant applications. Um, so this is some of our founding members. If you look really closely here, you can see um, uh, Hickenlooper in the background there. He was actually one of the founding members of Chinook Fund, interestingly enough. Um, and we were modeled back in 87 after the funding exchange, um, which is no longer functioning, but there, um, they were a funder in New York City who sort of set the bar around social justice grant making, community led grant making as a model. And we adopted that model um, back in 87 and had what we called a grant making committee up until 2016. And this grant making committee was made up of activists, people on the ground, um, social justice community leaders who really know, knew what was happening all across the state and on the ground in terms of new and emerging movements um, and, and were really experts in thinking about social justice and community organizing. And they made those decisions around our, our grant making, um, which worked well for a while, um, but you know, we ended up finding that we were bringing in less and less money. Um, people were getting super burnt out. This kind of work can be uh, quite draining and we were sort of relying on the same folks over and over again to be making those like really big decisions. Um, and we adopted a new grant making model that still relies on community members, but it's um, quite a bit more in depth and intensive um, called the Giving Project. Um, and this model, uh, we are a part of a national network uh, all across the country. Um, and this model, the Giving Project began in Seattle uh, through a fellow funder called Social Justice Fund Northwest. Um, and they built in popular education and a component of fundraising into their grant making model, which is um, really unique and beautiful. Um, and I'll talk about that uh, in depth as we, as we move forward. That is currently the model that we use now. Um, and this picture here is just of um, some of our board members at a retreat uh, within the last year or so. So um, here is a lovely map of our sister funds, so funders that uh, think about grant making the same way that we do, move money the same way that we do. Um, the uh, cities that have little stars have an actual giving project, and um, the ones that have circles um, just do community-led grant making. You can see when you look at our country here, the, the sort of Midwest in the middle of the country, uh, there's sort of less money being moved in this way to um, social justice and community organizing work. And we're the only funder in Colorado doing work in this way. Um, there are statistics coming out of um, I think it was a chronicle of philanthropy that says something like 4% of dollars nationwide are going to social justice uh, work and community organizing. Um, and we're proud to be part of that, but we also know that um, there's definitely a, a lack of funding for um, folks that are doing this really important systemic change work. Um, if anybody's interested, I'm happy to share this map with you after. Um, if you have compatriots all across the country who are looking for um, similar funding streams um, with all of these groups. So our mission, um, we are supporting grassroots organizations working on issues of social and economic justice by pooling our collective resources. We see groups making a positive systemic impact to improve quality of life for all Coloradans. So the key things to, to pay attention to here are we're trying to move money uh, to folks who are creating systemic change um, and really thinking about that from an intersectional lens um, of who is making decisions um, and who's directing where those funds are going. And then I have our values here. I'm gonna pull up, I can read them to you. So these are our four values that we really use as anchor points when we're thinking about our work, uh, liberation, uh, in our words and actions, we honor the inherent dignity, strength, and wisdom of the individual and the collective. We actively challenge practices that dehumanize and isolate people and cultivate practices that bring people together across our differences to achieve community-led systemic change, justice, and peace. We believe everyone has a role to play in collective liberation. And we have community. We build caring, respectful relationships with one another, recognizing our interdependence. We are committed to action that moves us closer, 
moves us all closer to our vision of liberation, connection, and abundance. We honor our relationship with the natural world, which sustains us all. Integrity. We're honest, accessible, and transparent in our work, and advocate for the same in our partner organizations and in the field of philanthropy. We understand the power, the power and responsibility that comes with being a steward of financial resources and are accountable to our constituents. We encourage, uh, sorry, leadership. We encourage learning, experimentation, and innovative thinking, as well as support the development of grassroots leaders. We embrace our role as leaders in the movement for social justice philanthropy and are willing to take strategic risks in service of our vision of abundantly resourced humans. So I, I just think our, um, um, our values are really beautiful and I feel like fairly rare in terms of um, how funders talk about their work. So I mentioned social justice philanthropy. Um, so this, uh, these uh, six tenants are taken from Resource Generation, which is a partner um, of ours nationally. Um, and their Resource Generation is working to activate youth who um, are young people who have access to wealth. Um, sort of 1% individuals to move their money into social justice philanthropy um, and to grassroots organizing work. So these six tenets, uh, social justice philanthropy focuses on the root causes of economic, racial, and social justice. Um, it's absolutely true for us. We're looking to fund folks who are moving upstream in terms of solutions to um, specific injustices in their work and in um, you know, their philosophies on why they're doing the work they do. Two, social justice philanthropy strives to include the people who are impacted by those injustices as leaders and decision makers. Um, so this is really, you know, how are we um, including our constituency uh, on the board level, on the staff level, and is particularly, um, you know, in the leadership of folks who are deciding where the funds go. Three, social justice philanthropy also aims to make the field of philanthropy more accessible and diverse. Um, a lot of times philanthropy looks pretty white, uh, wealthy and white, um, and that is what we're trying to change. Um, you know, in particular, elevating black leadership, leadership of people of a lower socioeconomic or poor um, class background, um, talking about race, talking about class, um, and all different levels of our organization is, is really a, a, an important value of ours. Um, four, in social justice philanthropy, foundations are accountable, transparent, and responsive in their grant making. Um, in particular, around the COVID pandemic um, and the uprisings, we uh, you know, have prioritized moving rapid response funds out to organizations um, that we funded previously in the past four years. Um, you know, we haven't really had the capacity to do a whole lot of technical assistance or rapid response funding, um, but this was, you know, we found this is a really crucial time where folks were needing funding. Um, so we made that happen and are still moving money out the door to our grantees um, for pandemic response work. Five, uh, donors and foundations act as allies to social justice movements by contributing not only monetary resources, but their time, knowledge, skills, and access. Uh, part of the Giving Project model, which I will talk about in depth in just a minute here, is skills building. Um, we're talking about race, we're talking about class, and folks are learning how to read grant applications, how to fundraise, how to go on site visits, sort of demystifying what it means to be in that funding seat, in that decision-making seat um, as, a, as a key part of our, as a part of our work and our grant making. And then finally, six, foundations use their assets and investments alongside grant making dollars to support their social justice missions. Um, we do have an endowment uh, that is a, a part of how we keep ourselves going. Um, and all of those funds are uh, invested in a socially responsible manner. Um, and recently we've collaborated um, with DreamSpring, um, uh, an investor, uh, to move some of that money to local initiatives as well. So, you know, we're really working to, to move all of our money into um, ways that are benefiting community. So once again, feel free to type any questions into the chat. It is a lot of me just talking at y'all right now. Um, and it's, you know, it's weird to not be in the room with all of you. Typically, this is a workshop that happens in person. Um, so it's, it's hard for me to read the room um, in this workshop. So I'm going to talk a lot about the Giving Project now. This is our primary grant making uh, vehicle. 
um, and we have two grant cycles a year. Uh, we're moving into the fall one right now. Um, and there's always a giving project that goes along with the grant making cycle. Um, and so we're kind of constantly in this uh, recruitment phase, bringing in new people because we have new giving project cohorts each grant making cycle. Um, and those cohorts are typically 20 to 25 people, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little less. Um, and they commit to the six months of intensive grant making. Um, and uh, there's, there's three primary phases, uh, but this is really, it's leadership development, it's skills building, um, and it's just a, a, a core part of how we function. Uh, so we're really led by these, these folks who come into our, our giving project. Um, so the phase one, um, this is getting to know each other. It's been a process to transition to Zoom. Um, you know, when you're talking about uh, race, when you're talking about class, um, there's there's magic that happens uh, in in-person interactions. Um, but we are uh, we're we're transitioning. We're figuring out new tools. We're figuring out ways to connect um, over Zoom. Uh, but this phase one is a get to know you, and then building. Um, political education uh, frameworks into how folks are, are looking at grant making. Um, so there's sort of a deep dive weekend on uh, racial justice, how we think about race um, and equity, and then also economic justice. Um, and all of the volunteers in the Giving Project are intentionally recruited across race and class lines. So it's really a, a diverse group of folks who are coming together to talk about um, their experiences. And then uh, they move into the skill building phase where I'm sharing a lot about our grant making process, our criteria, um, what, what sort of information they're actually going to use to evaluate um, all of the applications that they receive. Uh, and then um, they are learning about fundraising, learning about how to ask people for money, because as they move into phase three, they are reading all of the grants, they are going on site visits, they're making really difficult decisions around what groups to fund and what groups not to fund and also fundraising from their personal networks for all of the grant dollars that go out each grant cycle. So it's really an intensive process and it's so beautiful to see, um, you know, the sort of networks that people tap into all across uh, the country, even the world. We've gotten donations from France and Canada um, as, uh, you know, the, the project culminates in uh, dollars coming in and then dollars going out to a lot of really incredible organizations over the course of the giving project. So to give you a sense of what the actual process looks like in terms of uh, timing here. Um, so applications are due on the 21st of September. So that is the first thing that happens. Um, and these are, these are the pieces of the Giving Project that are the most relevant to you all to know, but you can sort of follow along this pathway here. You can see all of the different sessions um, that, they're, that they're going through um, during the cycle. Um, but applications are due on the 21st. If you uh, are interested in joining a giving project, um, it is full for the fall, but there are openings for the spring. You can't apply and be in the giving project at the same time. There's just an inherent conflict of interest there. Um, but we do absolutely recommend um, that organizations join a giving project, especially if you're new to Chinook Fund and are really interested in the way that we fund. Um, it gives you that sort of insider knowledge um, as to how, how we fund and who we fund and why. Um, so a part of the uh, giving project process is um, a grantee panel called Meet the Changemakers that I recommend everybody join. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's extremely inspiring to hear from organizers um, that are doing work all across Colorado, but it also gives you a sense as an applicant, um, what kind of work does Chinook fund? How do they talk about their work? How are they positioning themselves? Um, gives great insight into, um, into our grantees. Um, so, as the applications move through here, um, there's a pre-screening um, as applications first come in to make sure uh, that organizations meet our basic eligibility, which I will share um, later. And then they're forwarded on to the giving project. Um, they review the applications and at um, the screening meeting, they decide which organizations will be site visited and which organizations will not be funded. Um, as they as they evaluate groups according to our criteria. So after that screening meeting, um, the Giving Project members will reach out to applicants that are selected for a site visit individually um, to set up those meetings and all of that is virtual at this at this time. So you'll have uh, a Zoom site visit 
And then the final decisions meeting is when the Giving Project members all come together and decide collectively which groups they're going to fund and they um, distribute they distribute all of the their hard uh, fundraised dollars out at that time as well. So how do the Giving Project members evaluate applicants? We have three primary criteria. Uh, the first is constituent-led, the second is community-wide, and the third is lasting effect. And I will talk about all these in detail, but I do just want to read the definitions to you, um, and you can meditate on them uh, and, and think about what questions you have that come up for you and how your work relates to this. So for us, constituent-led means work. the work is led by the people most impacted by injustice. We believe that those most affected by injustice have the vision and solutions for their own liberation. And you can see how some of this ties back to the social justice uh, philanthropy tenants that I talked about earlier. But the work is led by those that are affected. Um, and this, of course, uh, you know, if your work doesn't align with these, it doesn't mean it's not good work. Um, but it does mean that, uh, you know, you're not in great alignment with us. And we fund very specific types of work. Uh, so the second criteria here is community-wide. Um, we think about this in terms of intersectionality. So the work reflects all members of the constituency and community, but in particular, those who experience multiple forms of oppression within a community. And we'll talk about this um, a little bit more. Constituent or community-wide doesn't necessarily mean you have to have somebody of every identity, um, but it does mean that you are you're, you're working in community with or in coalition with groups who represent identities you might not have um, on your board or on your staff uh, that are experiencing those multiple forms of oppression, that are experiencing a, a situation of injustice in a really particular way. And then finally, lasting effect. The work makes meaningful change for the community as a whole and for future generations not just one individual in the immediate future. And this sort of relates to the systemic change um, lens that we're looking at uh, social justice uh, community organizing. How are you making change for you know, this community as a whole as opposed to providing a service just to one person? Um, and a lot of our grantees do both, right? They're providing direct services and doing systemic change work. Um, you know, there's not one right way to, to do the work, but we're really focused on that systemic change. So um, this is sort of the, the, the baseline in terms of how we're evaluating organizations. All applicants must be based in communities facing injustice or oppression. Um, you know, there's definitely a place uh, in the work in organizing for, um, you know, people who are using their privilege to shift how power dynamics operate, to shift systems. But we're really looking to move money to folks who are experiencing injustice or oppression and you know, have creative solutions for their own liberation. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't have white people on your board or on your staff, um, but, it, but it does mean that like, really your constituency is those folks that are uh, facing a particular injustice or oppression. Um, all successful applicants must have democratic leadership and decision-making that is led by and accountable to those directly impacted by the issue. We don't fund organizations that have you know, only one leader or they don't have any way that they're getting feedback from their constituency. And we do look for that um, in your application and on the site visit. All successful applicants must engage in dismantling privilege and oppression within their organization and community. So that's like looking closely at, you know, uh, you know how is white supremacy showing up in your organization, um, in you know who you are finding yourself speaking to, who you feel like you're accountable to, um, you know we want to know that that you're thinking about those about those pieces. And finally, all successful applicants must demonstrate that their work can lead to permanent progressive change for their community. So really, why why are you using the mechanisms that you are um, in the work that you're doing? Um, and we, we also realize that, you know, groups that are very new might not have the same ways to demonstrate that their work can lead to permanent progressive change, but we do want to know why, why you think that your solutions are the ones that work for you. Um, I did, you know, we were adding this note here. Um, so we have a lot of very uh, beautiful um, and well thought out curriculum um, around how uh, the Giving Project is um, centering uh, certain identities and communities, you know, we're working nationally 
to constantly update our curriculum um, to make sure that we really are on the cutting edge of social justice, philanthropy, and philosophy. Um, and right now, the anti-oppression frameworks that our National Giving Project um, Collaborative are centering are Black liberation and Indigenous sovereignty. When we think about the folks who have experienced the most oppression in our country and those voices that we really want to center and lift up, um, we're looking at Black liberation and Indigenous sovereignty as our national priority. So this doesn't mean that this is the only type of work Chinook will fund. We fund all different types of organizing um, and liberation work, um, but these are the voices that we are working to center in our, in our work internally, uh, board and staff, and also externally in the groups that we're looking at funding. So this next piece here is on you know, this isn't you need to be doing these things, but this is what we like to see um, in terms of groups that are a good fit for applying for of funding and being funded. Um, groups that are working in alliance and collaboration with other organizations. It's really easy when you start looking at the nonprofit industrial complex oops, sorry, um, to get siloed. You see organizations that are doing the same type of work, but not collaborating with each other. Um, we don't want to see organizations that are trying to reinvent the wheel as opposed to connecting um, with other groups that are doing similar work. We want to know that you're being strategic and working with a long-term vision that we can see um, is linked. Sorry, are we having audio difficulties? Is everybody else doing okay? Thumbs up? Okay. Vienna, I'm happy to share the recording with you afterwards um, if you're still having trouble. Um, so we want to see that your work plan lines up with, um, you know, how you talk about your work and your long-term vision. Um, we want to see that, you know, you've been able to achieve concrete successes that have positively impacted the community. Of course, if you're a totally new startup organization, um, that might not be possible, which is why this is just a priority and not um, a mandate. We love to see organizations that see themselves as a part of the larger movement for social justice. How are you connected nationally? How are you talking to other groups all across the country um, that are doing similar justice work? Um, this next piece, shifting paradigms and offering alternatives to existing institutions and systems that perpetuate injustice. Um, you know, there are definitely situations where, you know, the best way to combat injustice is to help folks figure out how to navigate the system. But we're also interested in groups that are thinking about, well, what if we didn't need to have that system in the first place, right? And, and often it's both, right? How do we help folks navigate the system, but also work to dismantle that oppressive system um, at the same time? Uh, and the last two here are taking risks by doing work that is controversial, marginalized, and or new and emerging. I don't know that you hear this from funders often, but like, we want to fund the risky work. We want to fund that new um, innovative way that you're thinking about, uh, you know, combating injustice in your community. Um, tell us about it. We're, we're interested and excited to hear about it. And then finally, you know, how are you evaluating work? Uh, it looks different for all different kinds of uh, organizations. It could be a talk back circle at the end of a meeting. Um, it could be surveys. You know, we're just interested in, in knowing that you are evaluating your work and knowing that you know, you're meeting the needs of your community. So what we do not fund, um, groups that only do direct services to individuals. So that could look like, you know, providing food to people and that's all you do, you know, um, or, you know, um, giving rides to folks after school. Uh, you know, just direct service work we do not fund, but a lot of organizations that do that in conjunction with systemic change work, we do fund. Um, groups with budgets over 350,000, we do not fund. So our budget cutoff is 350,000. Um, we do not fund um, individuals or organizations that are controlled by one individual. We wanna know you have community support and are accountable to community. We don't fund scholarship requests. Um, we don't fund profit-making organizations. Now, if you are a worker-owned cooperative, just reach out to me and be happy to chat with you about your, um, your alignment with us. Um, we don't fund other foundations or pass-through funding. Um, typically, if I get uh, an application from a group that just has the word foundation in their name, I'm gonna reach out to you to check in. Um, we don't fund um, organizations whose work or decision-making body is based outside of Colorado. Um, we want to know, you know, we're really, we're really focused on um, groups that are organizing in Colorado. Um, but the possible exception is regional indigenous groups who, 
you know, don't recognize the, the borders of Colorado as a state, but do work um, in area that overlaps. Um, we don't fund attempts to influence the election of individuals for a public office. This sort of falls under general 501c3 guidelines. Um, and we also don't fund direct union organizing. Uh, feel free to chat any questions uh, that come up as, as we go through this too. So this next piece, um, I'm sharing with you the questions that we give to the Giving Project members as they're reading applications. So these are the questions they're going to be asking of your work um, if you decide to apply. So for constituent-led, you know, they're trying to figure out if the work is really led by those most impacted by the injustice. So, you know, how is the organization demonstrating uh, that their work is driven uh, by the people it affects? Uh, does leadership reflect the people most affected? Um, and then in particular, uh, youth organizing, that can be a little tricky because of like, you know, some rules around whether youth can be on boards or be on staff. Um, but, you know, we want to know how youth voice is being incorporated into leadership. Often there's an advisory board or decision making body. Um, how do we know that an organization is really accountable to youth? Uh, we do have a question here on whether the organizations have to be an existing 501c3. Um, typically, yes, organizations need to either uh, have a 501c3 be in the process or have a fiscal sponsor. Um, and that is, if that isn't the case, uh, feel free to reach out to me and we can, we can chat, but typically that is what we require. Um, so next is community-wide. So the questions that are being asked of an application of an organization um, does the organization work towards change that will affect all members of a constituency? Um, in particular, you know, I think this sort of comes out of the idea that um, the experience of a black man um, and a woman are so different than the sort of compounding of experiences of a black woman, right, and a, a black trans woman at that. And, you know, when we're thinking about issues that affect black people, um, you know, to really look at it from the lens of uh, black trans woman experience um, really takes into account all of the different um, sort of intersections of oppression that might affect a community. So we want to know that you're thinking about that, you know, because um, we bring all of our biases with us into this work. Um, is the organization working to build a multiracial, multi-class, multi-gendered social justice movement? And are they thinking about intersectionality versus diversity? You know, are you just um, adding certain people to your board to say you have them, you know, how are you incorporating, uh, you know, all of the voices of the folks in your community. And the way that the Giving Project looks at um, the constituent-led and the community-wide on some level is a tool that we have called the diversity chart, which we'll talk about in a bit here. Finally, lasting effect. So how do we know you're creating systemic strategic change? Um, how does this organization define the root cause of the issue? This is also, this is really helpful for our uh, giving project members to understand how you're thinking about systemic change. You know, what do you see as the actual issue and how are you looking to shift that? Okay, so just a note on what we prioritize. This doesn't mean this is the only thing that we fund in the same way that I talked about, you know, we're centering uh, black liberation and indigenous sovereignty. It isn't the only work that we fund. Um, we are prioritizing rural organizations. We do fund all across the state, but we also are aware um, that groups that are outside of the front range, front range in particular just have less access to resources and connection that groups in Denver do. And because we're in Denver, those are the groups that often hear about us first. Um, and so we're really prioritizing uh, rural organizing. And then the second piece here is we're prioritizing community organizing. So this is a specific type of change work. Um, and we are defining uh, community organizing as the process of bringing affected people together to use their collective power to win improvements in their community and change the power structure to advance social justice. So I'm gonna talk through some examples of change work um, that sort of lead into uh, you know, how we define community organizing. And this is actually sort of taken from an exercise that the Giving Project members go through to help them sort of tease out what community organizing can look like it means. Um, a great example of community organizing is a grantee of ours, Denver Justice Project. Um, they um, have been particularly active um, in response to the uprisings that have happened this summer. Um, in creating community responses to, um, or community alternatives to policing, in particular replicating the STAR model out of Eugene. 
Um, so they're active. Uh, definitely recommend checking them out. Um, they're, you know, led by survivors of police brutality who are really working to, to change the system. Um, so um, these are some different types of change work we have here. So we're looking at community organizing and community organizing can encompass a lot of these pieces, um, but there are some important distinctions that I just want to point out. Um, so I'm going to go through and define what services, direct services work um, looks like to us and how we define it, what empowerment work looks like, how we define it, um, examples of all of these education and advocacy, and then um, a great example of community organizing. So services we define as, you know, uh, supplying basic services to people who need them. So uh, food, healthcare, shelter, transportation. And I think this is pretty straightforward. So here's a great example, um, a community-based health center that provides birth control, pregnancy tests, well woman care, and abortions. They have a fund that offers financial support to people who can't pay for their services. Um, they also offer financial support to people who have to travel from out of town for their abortion and need to pay, stay in a hotel or pay for gas. So you can see this is sort of like a one-off support um, relationship situation. They're not working to change the system, but they're helping people navigate it. Empowerment is another type of change work that we see a lot, um, providing programs that focus on supporting positive identity development and self-esteem among marginalized groups. So it's sort of that more internal work. So this example, and all of these are fictionalized. Um, Healthy You, Healthy Us is a youth program run by the county health department. They work in public schools teaching a comprehensive sex ed class. Students learn about safer sex, contraception options, sexuality and healthy communication. Middle and high school students are paired with student mentors who have graduated from the program already. And they have an after school program where the students do service project in the community service projects in the community. So you can see how this example is sort of doing that internal change work, but maybe not changing the system specifically, um, sort of targeting, targeting larger systemic uh, causes of injustice. The next, the next piece here is uh, education and advocacy, raising the visibility of a cause and advocating for or against policies on behalf of, key here, on behalf of the group affected by the problem to lawmakers, decision makers, media, and other stakeholders. Um, so a lot of the times with ed education and advocacy work we see is not necessarily constituent led. Um, and we really wanna know that constituents are leading more in, in policy change and systems change. So this uh, fictionalized example, the Act for Reproductive Rights is the state affiliate of a national organization dedicated to making abortion accessible to all. They fight anti-abortion laws and lobby to secure pro-choice policies across the state. They've created an annual policy report card and an Advo app to download to stay up to date on reproductive rights legislation coming down the pipe, but they have no people from the local community with intersecting identities and leadership positions in the organization. So that's the sort of key piece here, you know, how, how are your constituents fully represented in, um, you know, any sort of advocacy work. And then finally, we are at community organizing. So the process of bringing affected people together to use their collective power to win improvements in their community and change the power structure to advance social justice. And this is really the work that Chinook is prioritizing in funding right now. So this example is Powerful Families, a woman of color led organization working for reproductive justice across the state. They're working for more than abortion rights, talking about access to abortions in rural areas, access to contraception, the right to have children, the ability to parent, children with dignity, childcare, housing, et cetera. After conducting a series of listening sessions, they created a community report, and now they're partnering with other groups from around the state to lobby at the Capitol for abortion access, people who don't qualify for Medicaid, undocumented immigrants, people who have been legal permanent residents for less than five years, et cetera. Now, of course, this is a fictionalized representation of what community organizing can look like. Um, and this stuff is hard. It's hard to like fully embody um, all of these criteria. And, and so the one piece I do want to add is, you know, we want to know how you're working towards this. Maybe you're not there yet, but how are you working towards, you know, fully being constituent, like fully representing your community, um, being community-wide? Any questions that are coming up around these pieces? 
this is to give you insight into how you know our giving project members are learning about social justice, community organizing work, and how they're thinking about what could be your applications um, in this upcoming cycle. Just some more components of community organizing work. Um, having a grassroots base of support, um, showing that you have a strategic direction driven by that base, uh, clear demands for policy or systems change, a power map, which means knowing what leaders in the community or what organizations you need to put pressure on to actually make that systems change happen. You know, what's your strategy? Who do you need to, who do you need to push? And then a leadership ladder, which is really how are you moving constituents from members into leadership of the organization. A lot of times, you know, nonprofits or even funders will be hiring from the outside as opposed to promoting folks from within who really understand the work into leadership positions. And uh, these components came from Groundswell Fund, a, a fellow funder. Um, Dana, yes, um, I will talk about grantees and what their projects look like too, that's a great question. Um, I, we also want to add some nuance because, of course, not everybody is lobbying um, or pushing for policy change. You know, uh, community organizing work can look um, can look more nuanced. Um, and in particular, you know, we share these definitions and remind our um, giving project folks to also take into account um, cultural organizing um, and healing justice, which I will explain in the next slide. But Cultural organizing integrates arts and culture into organizing strategies. So this might not look like protesting and being on the front lines, right? Um, but it's still relevant and still important. Um, so it's organizing from a particular tradition, cultural identity, community of place, or worldview. So one good example of that is El Frente de Lucha. Um, and they take youth out to Tierra Amarilla in New Mexico. Um, and a lot of their work is around cultural identity. Um, these youth are native Chicana, Mexicana youth who border, the borders cross them, right? So, um, you know, they're, it, it's, it is radical work to even learn about your history and then bring that back out into your community, which is, is really the focus of El Frente de Lucha. Uh, but they also have other organizing strategies as well um, to take care of their community. And then healing justice, um, how oppressed communities holistically respond to and intervene on generational trauma and violence, and how they innovate collective practices that can impact and transform the consequences of oppression on their bodies, hearts, and minds. Um, and so a great example of, uh, a great example of this is frontline farming. Um, they have a black and brown growers collective. They're really looking at how um, capitalism and colonization has affected uh, the relationship of people of color and black people with food. Um, and they're, you know, revolutionizing how uh, farming is even happening um, and like what the food, food chain looks like. Um, so healing on that sort of like food um, relationship with the earth level uh, is really powerful. Okay. So moving into our grantees. Um, so these are the stats currently. We've crested 1,000 grants over the last 32 years, which is awesome, and moved $3.6 million to 382 organizations. And a lot of these groups have been funded um, you know, many times. Uh, you know, we have some groups that have been funded since Chinook Fund was founded. You know, a lot of this um, sort of more uh, progressive change work um, you know, there's not a lot of funders who are interested in funding risky work. So um, we are happy to continue to support organizations whose budgets are within our budget cap and who meet our criteria. Okay, and I have a video here. Uh, let me know if the audio is funky. Um, I'm using Canva, so I think that everything should work well, but this is from a video series that we did for our 30th anniversary. Hmm. So it it's sounding like you all can't hear. 
Um, what, I'll, what I'll do is share out this YouTube video. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'll share out this YouTube video. I'm sure you're all familiar with Candy C. DeVaca. Um, she's a councilwoman. She, a uh, former executive director of Project Voice. Um, and she's just talking about her relationship with Shana Fund and feeling validated as a constituent-led um, organization, um, supporting youth to really make change in their communities, and wishing that all funders would fund in the way that Shana Fund did to validate their work. So I'm going to give just a, an overview. Uh, we had a grant-making evaluation. Uh, unfortunately, this is dated. It's from 2013 to 2017, um, but it's still relevant um, in terms of uh, what the focus areas of our grantees have been um, over that time period. Uh, and you can see we've had a lot of arts, culture, and media, and youth organizing, um, but that in particular is because these groups, uh, the focus areas overlap, so a group can identify in uh, multiple different categories. So we did have a lot of youth organizing work um, during those years and currently. Um, but you can see there's a wide array of types of work that we'll fund. Um, and we're excited about groups that fall into multiple categories. Um, it's hard to give a great example of um, this is what radical work looks like and this is what you know the, the, the work that we fund other than the ones that I, that I shared, um, Al Frente de Lucha um, and Frontline Farming. Um, but yeah, uh, a wide variety of types of work that we will fund. And then this is part of why, you know, we're really prioritizing rural organizing. When we take a look at this heat map, you can see a lot of our funding has been in Denver, um, you know, with, with sort of little, little pockets here and there. Um, but we really want to, we really want to be supporting more organizations that have less access to resources um, all across the state and that are really working to do that change work because it's, it's harder if you're in a conservative area. So. And, and the best way, you know, to get to know our grantees, you can go to our website, um, take a look at these groups, check out their websites. Um, you can see the groups listed here. Atlantis Adapt, um, if you're familiar, they're the reason that the Americans with Disabilities Act exists. They started in Denver. Um, gosh, I, I can't remember how long it's been. Maybe it's been 30 years since that, since that was passed. Um, and they uh, literally put their bodies on the line to make that happen. They went out and protested about their inability to access transportation um, and facilities and you know, got out of their wheelchairs and climbed up the, the state capitol steps. So, I mean, to me, that's an example of radical work. Um, it's pretty wild and absolutely effective. Um, totally recommend that you check out their work. They're, they're always out there protesting um, disability rights work. Um, the other way uh, that I very much recommend that you get to know our grantees is to join and meet the change makers. So the next one is in November, so there's a little bit of time. Um, but, you know, we will have local organizers talking about their work, talking about what's happening right now um, in Denver. And then also, please feel free to sign up for our newsletter. Um, we're sharing out events and information about the organizations that we fund, um, and you can get a good sense of, you know, what what kind of work do we fund and how are these people talking about where they are in the community and what they do? So now we'll move more into logistics. So um, the timeline for this cycle, uh, the application deadline is September 21st. The application's live um, on our grant making portal. Um, so when we get to that, you know, feel free to click through and follow along. Uh, the screening meetings where groups uh, will be uh, the, where the giving project decides whether a group is site visited or not funded um, is happening in December. You will get a notification um, if you're not funded or if you are selected for a site visit at that time. Um, then site visits will happen from December through February. Um, we try to give folks as much lead time as possible uh, to make sure that you can bring your constituency to those visits. Uh, the final decisions meetings, there's several of them because Zoom fatigue is real and sitting on Zoom for eight hours is just impossible. So we have to split that up. But those happen in February and then notifications go out uh, mid-February for this uh, upcoming fall cycle. I'm just reading some questions here. Oh, yes. Um, so the site visit is all over Zoom. Um, so you can do that from wherever is most convenient for you having access to a computer. So um, the GLM or Grant Life Cycle Manager is my baby. Um, up until a year ago, we were accepting 
paper applications. I would spend hours of my life copying papers and making sure that all of the papers are there for all of our folks, killing trees nonstop. Um, so I'm so happy that we have an online uh, grant making system. It makes life so much easier. Um, and it makes, hopefully it makes life so much easier for you all as well. So uh, to get there, you can type in tiny.cc slash grant or um, navigate through our website. I would recommend bookmarking the page once you get to it. Um, and the first thing you'll want to do uh, is create a new account. Now, if you are an organi organization that's applied to Chinook Fund before, um, either you as an individual or an actual organization, um, feel free to check in with me. If you can't log in or you think there might be an account, I'm happy to reset your password for you. It's really easy for me to do on the back end. Um, you will have to fill out four sections when you create your account, uh, organization information, individual user information, executive officer information, and of course, uh, choosing a password. Um, all of this stuff is pretty self-explanatory. Um, your and your account ID will typically be your email address when you're logging in. So this is just the notification that is on the front page. So if you think your organization has applied before, please just reach out to me. I'm happy to to open up an account for you um, on the back end, so that we don't have duplicate. Um, accounts and that we can have all of your information together. So this basic eligibility quiz, I mentioned this uh, before, but this is how we kind of screen out folks who are like very much not aligned with what we want to fund, in particular budget of over 350,000. Um, and then uh, we want to fund groups that are based in Colorado, with the exception of a regional indigenous group. Somehow some people still slide through these questions and I don't know how, but um, it does help uh, quite a bit. And so once you fill out this eligibility quiz uh, and you pass, and you know, if you, if you type in the wrong thing by mistake, just let me know, I can reopen it for you. It will bring you to the actual application to access um, for fall 2020. This is fall 2019 because it's an old screenshot, but um, you can click apply and then it will bring you into the entirety of the application, all the information um, that we would like to see from you. And yes, you can have multiple people um, attached to an organization. Yes. Um, so these are all of the pieces here in this green box um, that we ask for. And you know, if you uh, you know you want to use an e-reader or um, would prefer to access things offline, print things out, um, you can export uh, the question list via PDF here. Um, and there are some pieces to note here. Uh, you know, the 21st is a soft deadline. Like, please try and get it in um, by midnight on the 21st. If you can't, let me know. You know, I'm I'm always open to make exceptions um, for folks. You never know what's happening, especially right now, like life is so wild for so many people. Um, there are some required questions. Um, you will get an error message if you don't fill it out. Um, those have a little asterisk next to them. Um, you know, you can click to open all of these fields and then collapse them if you don't want your screen to be full. Um, some, uh, you know, you typically want to hit save as much as you can, but there are some auto save um, functionalities so you won't lose all of your work. Um, and then this question list versus application packet uh, just refers to the fact that you can export the question list um, if you want to type it into a Word document outside um, of the portal. So um, those of you who have applied before, I think we have a couple of uh, repeat folks in this session. Um, if you hit the home button when you log in, you can see all of your active requests, your historical requests, um, if you have final reports due or a grant agreement due, all of that will be listed here. Um, and then, you know, we will notify you before the system does um, about whether you're funded or not. Um, but, you, you know, if you go back and look at old requests, it will see whether you are, you know, it will indicate whether you are funded or not. Um, you know, you can always start on the application and come back. Um, so, you know, you would just click on edit application to continue, um, to continue adding to it. Um, like I said, it's a soft deadline. So once we hit the 21st, uh, you'll get a notification that says, you know, this is past due. Um, please reach out to me if you think that's going to be the case for you. 
this is also pretty straightforward, but we, we're including all the details here. Um, uh, yes, Gloria, you will need to retake the eligibility quiz because sometimes your budget goes up. So we just want to make sure. Um, you do want to log out. Uh, you will be logged out after 90 minutes of inactivity. Um, so you do want to make sure that you save um, at least every 90 minutes, hopefully soon. Because, you know, I, typically best practice is type answers into a Word document and then copy and paste in um, just so you don't lose work. But uh, if you don't want to do that, make sure you hit save every 90 minutes. So an overview of like the actual content that we want and not just the logistics. Um, we want to know your mission statement, where you are, uh, your 501c3 status, whether you have a fiscal sponsor, who that fiscal sponsor is. Um, we are, you know, we do look pretty closely actually at fiscal sponsorship agreements just because we want to make sure that our grantee, potential grantees are protected. Um, those relationships can get kind of complicated sometimes and it's a little confusing um, with the IRS guidelines of what fiscal sponsor versus fiscal agent means. Um, so it's part of our commitment to, um, you know, providing information um, and resources to the groups that we fund. We have a good amount of narrative uh, funding questions um, that I will talk about in detail. Um, uh, the narrative encompasses a lot of those. Uh, we do want a one-year work plan, uh, which we do have a sample of if you're interested in seeing what that could potentially look like. Um, there's a link in um, in the portal for you to download a PDF of what that could look like. Uh, and then uh, budget information. Um, you have the option of using your own budget information or we have a budget form for you to fill out. A lot of the groups that are applying are so new, budgets feel overwhelming. Maybe you don't yet have a formalized accounting partnership. Um, we understand uh, and I'm really happy to help folks if you get overwhelmed trying to figure out the budget form. Um, I'm here as a resource to you as you're starting to fill that out. Um, leadership information, we want to know who's leading the organization. So uh, bios uh, for all of your board and staff and members. And member typically means someone who has decision-making power, not, you know, um, you know, all, all 100 members of your organization who sometimes come to meetings. Um, and then the diversity chart, which we'll talk about in just a second here. And then references. Um, and those references cannot be um, someone who is currently on your board or, you know, a staff member of your organization, but someone from an organization um, or an individual who can speak to the work that your organization does in the community. So that is an overview. Um, so there's a place for you to type in goals and you have the option of adding multiple goals. And when you click um, add another goal, it will open up um, a whole new uh, question. So this is just a nice functionality so that the application isn't too overwhelming. Um, and then there are character limits, just pay attention to them. That doesn't mean that you have to type in all 2000 characters. Short and sweet is better. Um, so we, we're, oops, we're trying to, trying to limit um, how much narrative you actually have to write. Um, and then there are um, file upload fields for your budget forms um, and for the diversity chart, as well as bios as well. Um, yes, a reference could totally be from outside Colorado. Though, um, I would be interested to know as to why, uh, if your organization, you know, we really want to fund groups that are doing community organizing work in Colorado. Um, so I would be interested to chat, you know, about why you would why you would have a reference who is outside of Colorado to speak to the work that you're doing in Colorado, if that makes sense. Um, so the narrative questions here, um, there are 10 total. And uh, the giving project, this is how the giving project determines whether you align with our three criteria. Um, and there is a 2000 character limit on all of those. So the narrative questions cover all of these pieces. Uh, the next slide will have all of the individual questions and I'll just go through them with you right now. Uh, I would say yes, a reference could be a participant from one of your programs. That would be great, actually. Um, reference, sorry, I'm just reading the channel girl. Immigrant survey. Hmm. Megan, I'd be happy to chat afterwards just a, a little bit more about references. Um, so feel free to, to stay on. Okay, so the history uh, question, when did your group come together and why? Um, share major accomplishments and tell us about your recent activities, successes, and failures. Pretty straightforward. 
root causes. This is where, uh, you know, this question kind of gets at the lasting effect piece. Um, what is the specific problem or injustice that your group is trying to solve? And what are the root causes of the problem? Typically, those root causes look like racism, sexism, classism, uh, homophobia, transphobia, um, sort of pervasive cultural uh, pieces. Uh, action and lasting effect. What is your overall strategy for solving the injustice? Um, this is where we can kind of get at, uh, if you do direct services, how does that connect to organizing work? How does that connect to systems change? Um, constituent led, uh, we've talked about this already, but who is most impacted by the injustice you're fighting? Um, Community-wide, how does your organization de define diversity? Um, and then how do you ensure that everyone is represented in your organization? Organization, organizational structure and decision making. We just want to know how you make decisions. Who's really in power and, and how are you getting input from uh, the folks that are most affected? Movement building, I referenced previously. How does your group see itself as a part of the larger movement for social change? Fundraising strategies, so how are you bringing in money? Uh, how is the community supporting your organization? How will you sustain future work? We do often have groups who you know, have difficulty fundraising for the kind of activities that they're doing. Um, and that's okay. I, you know, the one thing that I will recommend is just be as transparent as you feel comfortable being in this application. Um, we see all different kinds of work. Uh, and we really want to know what your experience is like in the work that you're doing. Um, evaluation, how do you evaluate, reflect on, and make changes in your work. And then finally, site visit information. Um, if you were to receive a site visit, uh, what times would be good for you? This is also a place to indicate um, any accessibility needs that you have, interpretation, um, uh, anything from that uh, sort of perspective. You know, maybe if you're even needing a hotspot, you're having trouble having access to good internet connection, like please include all of that information there and we're, we're really doing our best to make all of our work super accessible to our, to our applicants. Any questions on the, on the narrative here? Um, I do want to make sure that I explain a lot of our application terms. So typically we do fund um, general operating uh, grants over project support. Um, we want our grantees to have flexibility with how they use their funds. Not a lot of funders want to uh, do general operating support, but we want you to pay your staff. Um, we want you to keep the lights on. Um, so in general, uh, I recommend that you apply for general operating unless there's a specific project that you know is really in alignment with us and maybe your overall organization is less in alignment. Um, that could be a situation where you would apply for project support. Um, current annual budget, uh, that is the income uh, line item. Uh, so we just wanna know what, what your total income is. Uh, fiscal year, um, so some organizations offer, operate on a calendar year. You know, you're looking at bank statements starting in January, ending in December. Uh, Shuna Fund operates uh, not on a calendar fiscal year, um, which can make things a little tricky um, for me thinking about what your budget for next year is versus the current year, depending on what your fiscal year is. So please just include that information so I can um, make sure I have those calculations. Um, so we have two types of grants that we give out, uh, startup and established. Startup, typically a group is less than four years old um, and they can apply for up to 4,000. Um, and established are groups of any age. Um, we, we definitely have had groups that are very new apply as established and be successful. I generally recommend that if you're less than four years old, take advantage of the startup um, category uh, because then you're not sort of in the pool with groups that have been doing this work for you know, 30 years or more. Um, but, you know, I, I also understand the draw of applying for up to 10,000. Typically, I also recommend that you apply fully for the 4,000 and apply fully for the 10,000, regardless of your category, right? If you're established, apply for 10. If you're startup, apply for four. Um, each uh, funding cycle, the giving project members fundraise different amounts, you know, um, it, it really depends on, uh, you know, what their fundraising efforts look like, what the economic climate looks like. Um, and so if you apply for the most, then you'll get the most um, that, that we can offer you. But 
but amounts do fluctuate um, each grant making cycle. We're really trying to push for at least 75% of 4,000 or 75% of 10,000, but it really depends um, on who applies and what the fundraising looks like. We don't mandate that the giving project members bring in a certain amount of money, um, so it fluctuates. Um, let's see, we have a question here. Stephanie, I'll answer this question at the end. Uh, thanks for sharing it though. Um, talking about organizational status, uh, typically, you know, you should be a 501c3 or fiscally sponsored um, organization. And then here's the link to the sample work plan, but it's also um, something you can click on in the application itself. Okay, so the uh, pieces that I will have you upload, um, you can see the different types of files that the um, portal will accept. Um, typically PDFs are best, but you know, whatever you have will be okay. Uh, if you have a fiscal agent or a fiscal sponsor, um, we want you to upload that agreement um, so that we know that that is all in accordance. Um, a work plan, and we ask that you upload leadership bios, so name, position, just a little bit of information about the folks that are on your staff, um, on your board, and in, um, in leadership. The diversity chart we have you upload, that's an Excel spreadsheet you download. Um, and then either our budget form or these three pieces, your last year financials, so the actuals, um, your current year approved budget, and then um, your year to date actual, so what has happened so far in your fiscal year. So this is just uh, to cover what our budget forms look like. Um, and you don't necessarily have to fill in each one of these light items, it depends on where your income is coming from, but could be individual contributions, membership dues. We do want to know all of the funders who are currently giving you uh, money. Um, corporate contributions, government grants, special events, um, in-kind, and then any sort of other um, income. Um, so you can see here, we've split this up into last fiscal year, current fiscal year, what your budget is, uh, what's happened so far, and then um, if you know the funds are dispersed in February and you're on a calendar fiscal year right now, we do wanna know what your budget looks like next year because the grant will technically be spent next year. Um, hopefully that makes sense. If it feels unclear, please type into the chat. I'm happy to sort of slow down um, to talk about what that timeline looks like. Then expenses, um, you know, hopefully you all are in a place where you can pay your staff. We know that that's not always the case. Um, salaries and wages, employee benefits, rent, supplies. Um, all of these pieces could be where you're spending your money and maybe there are different places. So of course there's some other list here. Um, and then we do want to know, you know, where are you thinking about spending uh, enough money, just so we have a sense. It could be rent, it could be, um, you know, utilities, it could be salaries. Um, okay, so up next is the leadership information. We do want you to type in the number of staff, board, and other leadership, and then I will go in and count, you know, do the bios that you've shared line up with this. Um, and then I will pester you if they aren't all in there. So um, just make sure those numbers match up with the bios you submit. And then uh, the beautiful and sometimes very confusing uh, diversity chart. Unfortunately, the software doesn't, uh, is not yet in a place where you can type it in and you know it, it does all the math for you. Uh, but this is what we do ask you to submit. Um, so we get a sense of the identities of the folks who are leading your organization, whether that matches up with who you say you're serving um, and who you say is leading the work. Um, so what you'll do is for your staff, board and other leadership, ideally is that you ask, um, how do you identify? Um, what is your age? Um, of course, uh, questions like sexual orientation and gender are, are really sensitive. Um, and if you feel like, you know, maybe your organization isn't in a place where you are talking about these things openly, um, you know, uh, we, we have tools uh, and trainings that, that, you know, we can share with you as a, you know, this can be an opening to start talking about um, sexual orientation, gender, um, a little bit more explicitly in your organization. But we also, you know, want, to know, want you to know that we're sensitive to the fact that, you know, not all communities are as open um, about these uh, identities as, as others. But, like, let me know. Reach out. Um, give us a sense of where you're at when you're starting to fill out this chart. 
um, so that we know, you know, you weren't ignoring it or didn't think it was important. Um, but what you'll do is you'll ask and then list the number of staff members who identify in each one of these categories. And ideally that total number will be the same across staff when you add them up for each category uh, of identity and the same for board and other leadership. Uh, we really want to encourage you to fill out the other identity slots here. Um, this gives us a sense of like, you know, how, how are you identifying yourselves? Um, we have people put in uh, religious affiliation, former incarceration status, former currently homeless. Um, you know, we want to know how you all, you know, the identities that you hold near and dear to your heart and, and how you're coming to this organizing work. Um, the uh, diversity chart, I don't know if it's available on our website. It, it's definitely available on the grant making portal. I'm happy to send you a, a copy of the Word document if you need it. So hopefully this is making sense um, as to how this works. And this is just an example um, to make it super clear. So looking at the folks who are on staff for an organization, we have one white person, one multiracial, one Latina, one Asian person, but all of those you know, same staff members, the four of them identify as ages 26 to 55. So you can see four here, four here. So you know, I do spend a little bit of my time like going through and, and counting um, and making sure that all the numbers line up. So give me a sense of how that works. Okay, so some um, more details about the application. Um, I'm happy to review your application if you'd like, um, and I'm happy to give you pointers as to, you know, how you could better explain your work where things are a little confusing, um, areas where I see more alignment or less, like my job is to um, help you uh, in this process. Uh, so you will submit online via the grant application portal, and I will reach out to you uh, via email if there's any more information, but please feel free to email me at any time via grants at shinnefund.org with any questions that come up. So deadline, September 21st, um, link to apply here, tiny.cc uh, slash CF grant. And that is the end of my talking. Um, there's